Oh, if you knew the trouble I seen. Oh, if you knew the trouble I seen. Okay, it's in the early morning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm hitting F4 and trying to get my shot for the next thrilling installment of the section of the chapter of the Ring Cow. From another world thing show that this is this is what you get okay um, <clears throat> let me see okay <clears throat> for the edification we bring you what Uncle Sam really wants. Part three. We began. <coughs> the Iran Contra cover up. Bet you always wanted to learn about that. The major elements of the Iran Contra story were well known long before the 1986 exposures. Apart from one fact, that the sale of arms to Iran via Israel and the illegal Contra war run out of Ali North's White House office were connected. It seems bizarre, but yeah, not so bizarre. These guys are actually pretty predictable. <clears throat> the shipment of arms to Iran through Israel didn't begin in 1980 five when the congressional inquiry and the special prosecutor pick up the story it began almost immediately after the fall of the shah in 1979 by 1982 it was public knowledge that israel was providing a large part of the arms for iran you could read it on the front page of the new york times guys <laughs> come on all right in february 1982 the main israeli figures whose names later appeared in the iran contra hearings appeared on bbc television and described how they helped organize an arms flow to the khomeini regime in october 1982 the israeli ambassador to the u.s stated publicly that israel was sending arms to the khomeini regime with the cooperation of the united states at almost the highest level the high Israeli officials involved also gave the reasons to establish links with elements of the military in Iran who might overthrow the regime, restoring the arrangements that had prevailed under the Shah. Standard operating procedure, folks. As for the Contra War, the basic facts of the illegal North CIA operations were known by 1985, over a year before the story broke, when a U.S. supply plane was shot down and a U.S. agent, Eugene Hassenfuss, was captured. The media simply chose to look the other way. So what finally generated the Iran-Contra scandal? A moment came when it was just impossible to suppress it any longer, when Hassan Fuss was shot down in Nicaragua while flying arms to the Contras for the CIA. And the Lebanese press reported that the U.S. National Security Advisor was handing out Bibles and chocolate cakes in Tehran the story just couldn't be kept under wraps. After that, the connection between the two well-known stories emerged. <clears throat> we then moved to the next phase, damage control. That's what the follow-up was about. The prospects for Eastern Europe What was most remarkable about the events in Eastern Europe in the 1980s was that the imperial powers simply backed off. Not only did the USR permit popular movements to function, it actually encouraged them. There are few historical precedents for that. It didn't happen because the Soviets are nice guys. They were driven by internal necessities, but it did happen, and as a result, the popular movements in Eastern Europe didn't have to face anything remotely like what they ha would have faced on our turf. The Journal of the Salvadoran Jesuits quite accurately pointed out in <clears throat> that in their country, Vaclav Havel, the former political prisoner who became president of Czechoslovakia, wouldn't have been put in jail. He might well have been hacked to pieces and left by the side of the road somewhere. 
The USSR even apologized for its past use of violence, and this too was unprecedented. U.S. newspapers concluded that because the Russians admitted that the invasion of Afghanistan was a crime that violated international law, they were finally joining the civilized world. That's an interesting reaction. Imagine someone in the U.S. media suggesting that maybe the United States ought to try to rise to the moral level of the Kremlin and admit that the attacks against Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia violated international law. <laughs> okay. Um, the one country in Eastern Europe where there was extensive violence as the tyrannies collapsed was the very one where the Soviets had the least amount of influence and where we had the most, Romania. Nikolai Ceausescu, uh, uh, is that right? Ceausescu, Ceausescu, the dictator of Romania, had visited England and was given uh, royal treatment. The United States gave him very favored nation treatment, trade advantages, and the like. Ceausescu was just as brutal and crazed then as he was later, but because he'd largely withdrawn from the Warsaw Pact and was following a somewhat independent course, we felt he was partially on our side in the international struggle. We're in favor of independence as long as it's in other people's empires, not in our own. Elsewhere in Eastern Europe, the uprisings were remarkably peaceful. There was some repression, but historically, 1989 was unique. I can't think of another case that comes close to it. I think the prospects are pretty dim for Eastern Europe. The West has a plan for it. They want to turn large parts of it into a new, easily exploitable part of the Third World. There used to be a sort of colonial relationship between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. In fact, the Russia's, Russians' blocking of that relationship was one of the reasons for the Cold War. Now it's being reestablished, and there's a serious conflict over who's going to win the race for robbery and exploitation. Is it going to be the German-led Western Europe currently in the lead, or Japan waiting in the wings to see how good the profits look? Or the United States trying to get into the act? There are a lot of resources to be taken and lots of cheap labor for assembly plants. But first, we have to impose the capitalist model on them. We don't accept it for ourselves, but the, for the third world, we insist on it. That's the IMF system. If we can get them to accept that, they'll be very, hast very easily exploitable and we'll move toward their new role as a kind of Brazil or Mexico. In many ways, Eastern Europe is more attractive to investors than Latin America. One reason is that the population is white and blue-eyed, and therefore easier to deal with for investors who come from deeply racist societies like Western Europe and the United States. More significantly, Eastern Europe has much higher general health and educational standards than Latin America, which except for isolated sectors of wealth and privilege, is a total disaster area. One of the few exceptions in this regard is Cuba, which does approach Western standards of health and literacy, but its prospects are very grim. One reason for this disparity between Eastern Europe and Latin America is the vastly greater level of state terror in the latter <clears throat> after the Stalin years. The second reason is economic policy. Blink! Mm. According to U.S. intelligence, the Soviet Union poured about $80 billion into Eastern Europe in the 1970s. The situation has been quite different in Latin America. Between 1982 and 1987, about $150 billion were transfer transferred from Latin America to the West. The New York Times cites estimates that hidden transactions, including drug money, illegal profits, might be in the, uh, etc., might be in the uh, 700 billion range. The effects in Central America have been particularly awful, but the same is true throughout Latin America. Uh, there's rampant poverty, malnutrition, infant mortality, environmental destruction, state terror, and collapse of living standards to the levels of decades ago. The situation in Africa is even worse. The catastrophe of capitalism was particularly severe in the 1980s, an unrelenting nightmare in the domains of the Western powers in the accurate terms of the head of the Organization of African Unity, 
Illustrations provided by the World Health Organization estimate that 11 million children die every year in the, quote, developing world, unquote. A, quote, silent genocide, unquote, that could be brought to a quick end if resources were directed to human needs rather than enrichment of a few. In a global economy designed for the interest and needs of international corporations and finance and sectors that serve them, most of the species become superfluous. They will be cast aside if the institutional structures of power and privilege function without popular challenge or control. No doubt about it. The Wilds rent -a -thug. For most of the century, the United States was far and away the world's dominant economic power, and that made economic warfare an appealing weapon, including measures ranging from a legal embargo to enforcement of IMF rules for the weak. But in the last 20 years or so, the U.S. has declined relative to Japan and German-led Europe thanks in part to the economic mismanagement of the Reagan administration, which threw a party for the rich when costs paid by the majority of the population with costs paid by the majority of the population in future generations. At the same time, however, U.S. military power has become absolutely preeminent. As long as the Soviet Union was in the game, there was a limit to how much U.S. force the U.S. could apply particularly in more remote areas where we didn't have a big conventional force advantage. Because the USSR used to support governments and political movements the U.S. was trying to destroy, there was a danger that the U.S. intervention in the Third World might explode into a nuclear war. war. With the Soviet deterrent gone, the U.S. is much more free to use violence around the world, a fact that has been recognized with much satisfaction by U.S. policy analysts in the past several years. In any confrontation, each participant tries to shift the battle to a domain in which it's most likely to succeed. You want to lead with your strength. Play your strong card. The strong card of the United States is force, so if we can establish the principle that force rules the world, that's a victory for us. If, on the other hand, a conflict is settled through peaceful means, that benefits us less, because our rivals are just as good or better in that domain. Diplomacy is a particularly unwelcome option unless it's pursued under the gun. The U.S. has very little popular support for its goals in the Third World. This isn't surprising, since it's trying to impose structures of domination and exploitation. A diplomatic settlement is bound to respond, at least to some degree, to the interests of the other participants in the negotiation, and that's a problem when your positions aren't very popular. As a result, negotiations are something the U.S. commonly tries to avoid. Contrary to much propaganda, that has been true in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Central America, and Central America for many years. Against this background, it's natural that the Bush administration should regard military force as a major policy instrument, preferring it to sanctions and diplomacy, as in the Gulf crisis, but since the U.S. now lacks the economic base to impose order and stability in the third world, it must rely on others to pay for the exercise, a necessary one, it's widely assumed, since someone must ensure a proper respect for the masters. The flow of profits from Gulf oil production helps, but Japan and German-led continental Europe must also pay their share as the U.S. adopts the mercenary role following the advice of the international business press. The financial editor of the conservative Chicago Tribune has been stressing these themes with particular clarity. We must be willing mercenaries paid for our ample services by our rivals using our monopoly power in the security market to maintain our control over the world economic system. We should run a global protection racket, he advises, selling protection to other wealthy powers who will pay us a war premium. This is Chicago where the words are understood. If someone bothers you, you call in the mafia to break their bones, and if you fall behind in your premium, your health may suffer too. To be sure, the use of force in the Third World is only a last resort. The IMF is a more cost-effective instrument than the Marines and the CIA if it can do the job. 
but the iron fist must be poised in the background available when needed. A Renathug roll also causes suffering at home. All of the successful industrial powers have relied on the state to protect and enhance powerful domestic economic interests, to direct public resources to the needs of investors, and so on. One reason why they are successful Pardon me, folks. Since 1950, the U.S. has pursued these ends largely through the Pentagon system, including NASA and the Department of Energy, which produces nuclear weapons. By now, we are locked into these devices for maintaining electronics, computers, and high-tech industry generally. Reaganite military Keynesian excesses added further problems. The transfer of resources to wealthy minorities and other government policies led to a vast wave of financial manipulations and a consumption binge. But there was little in the way of productive investment, and the country was saddled with huge debts. Government, corporate, household, and in the incalculable debt of unmet social needs as society drifts towards a third world pattern with islands of great wealth and privilege and a sea of misery and suffering. When a state is committed to such policies, it must somehow find a way to divert the population, to keep them from seeing what's happening around them. There are not many ways to do this. The standard ones are to inspire fear of terrible enemies about to overwhelm us and awe for our grand leaders who rescue us from disaster in the nick of time. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm the best president uh, with the greatest economy uh, ever in the history of America. I've done more for the Jesus than Jesus like that. Uh, man, I'm tired. Does it show? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, that has been the pattern right through the 1980s, requiring no little ingenuity as the standard device. The Soviet threat became harder to take seriously, so the threat to our existence has been Gaddafi and his hordes of international terrorists. Uh, yeah, right. Granada and its ominous air base. <laughs> it's a, they're going to bash us over the head with their nutmeg. <clears throat> Sandinistas marching on Texas. <laughs> Hispanic narco traffickers led by the arch maniac Noriega and crazed Arabs generally. Most recently, it's been Saddam Hussein. After he committed his soul crime, the crime of disobedience in August 1990, it has become more necessary to recognize what has always been true, that the prime enemy is the third world, which threatens to get out of control. These are not laws of nature. The processes and the institutions that engender them could be changed, but that will require cultural, social, and institutional changes of no little moment, including democratic structures that go far beyond periodic selection of representatives of the business world to manage domestic and international affairs. <clears throat> business leaders running things is the F word. Fascism. Yeah. That's basic stuff. Brainwashing at home. How the Cold War worked. Despite much pretense, national security has not been a major concern of U.S. planners and elected officials. The historical record reveals this clearly. Few serious analysts took issue with George Keenan's position that it is not Russian military power which is threatening us. It is Russian political power. October 1947, or with President Eisenhower's consistent view that Russians intended no military conquest of Western Europe, and that the major role of NATO was to convey a feeling of confidence to exposed populations, uh, confidence which will make them sturdier politically in their opposition to communist inroads. Uh, uh. 
Similarly, the U.S. dismissed possibilities for a peaceful resolution of the Cold War conflict, which would have left the political threat intact. In his History of Nuclear Weapons, McGeorge Bundy writes that he is aware of no serious contemporary proposal that ballistic missiles should somehow be banned by agreement before they were ever deployed. Even though these were the only potential military threat to the U.S., it was always the political threat of so-called Communism. That was the primary concern. Communism being defined in American foreign policy is the adoption of policies that are not profitable to the major Western economies uh, or make those countries unwilling or unable to augment the uh, major economies of the West. Uh, you can check that and the early chapters of uh, the political economy of American foreign policy written by the Woodrow Wilson Foundation with all its esteemed and distinguished uh, blowhard uh, uh, people. Anyway. Um, okay. Whew. Let's move forward. Onward and upward. Recall that communism is a broad term and includes all those with the ability to get control of mass movements, something we have no capacity to duplicate. As Secretary of State John Foster Dulles privately complained to his brother Alan, CIA director, the poor people are the ones they appeal to, he added, and they have always wanted to plunder the rich, so they must be overcome to protect our doctrine that the rich should plunder the poor. Of course, both the U.S. and USSR would have preferred that the other simply disappear. But since this uh, would obviously have involved mutual annihilation, a system of global management called the Cold War was established. According to the conventional view, the Cold War was a conflict between two superpowers caused by Soviet aggression, uh, in which we tried to contain the Soviet Union and protect the world from it. If this view is a doctrine of theology, there's no need to discuss it. If it's intended to shed some light on history, we can easily put it to the test, bearing in mind a very simple point. If you want to understand the Cold War, you should look at the events of the Cold War. If you do so, a very different picture emerges. On the Soviet side, the events of the Cold War were repeated interventions in Eastern Europe, tanks in East Berlin and Budapest and Prague. These interventions took place along the route that was used to attack and virtually destroy Russia three times in this century alone. The invasion of Afghanistan is one example of an intervention outside that route, though also on the Soviet border. On the U.S. side, intervention was worldwide, reflecting the status attained by the U.S. as the first truly global power in history. On the domestic front, the Cold War helped the Soviet Union entrench its military bureaucratic ruling class and power, and it gave the U.S. a way to compel its population to subsidize high-tech industry. It isn't easy to sell all that <coughs> to the domestic populations. The technique used was the old standby fear of a great enemy. The Cold War provided that, that too. No matter how outlandish the idea that the Soviet Union and its tentacles were strangling the West, the evil empire was in fact evil, was an empire, and was brutal. Each superpower controlled its primary enemy, its own population, by terrifying it <clears throat> with the quite real crimes of the other. In crucial aspects, when the Cold War was a kind of tacit agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States, under which the U.S. conducted its wars against the Third World and controlled its allies in Europe, while the Soviet rulers kept an iron grip on their internal empire and their satellites in Eastern Europe, each side using the other to justify repression and violence in its own domains. Blink! So why did the Cold War end, and how does its end change things? <laughs> By 1970s, Soviet military expenditures were leveling off and internal problems were mounting with economic stagnation and increasing pressures for an end to tyrannical rule. Soviet power internationally had, in fact, been declining for some 30 years, as a study by the Center for Defense Information showed in 1980. 
A few years later, the Soviet system had collapsed. The Cold War ended with the victory of what had always been the far richer and more powerful contestant. The Soviet collapse was part of the more general economic catastrophe of the 1980s, more severe in most of the third world domains of the West than in the Soviet Empire. As we've already seen, the Cold War had significant elements of North-South conflict, to use the contemporary euphemism for the European conquest of the world. Much of the Soviet Empire had formerly been quasi-colonial dependencies of the West. The Soviet Union took an independent course, providing assistance to targets of Western attack and deterring the worst of Western violence. With the collapse of the Soviet tyranny, much of the region can be expected to return to its traditional status, which the former higher echelons of the bureaucracy, with the former higher echelons of the bureaucracy playing the role of the third world elites that enriched themselves while serving the interests of foreign investors. But while this particular phase is ended, north-south conflicts continue. One side may have called off the game, but the U.S. is proceeding as before, more freely, in fact, with Soviet deterrence a thing of the past. It should have surprised no one that George Bush celebrated the symbolic end of the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, by immediately invading Panama and announcing loud and clear that the U.S. would subvert Nicaragua's election by maintaining its economic stranglehold and military attack unless our side won. Nor did it take great insight for Elliot, Abram, Elliot Abrams to observe that the U.S. invasion of Panama was unusual because it could be conducted without fear of a Soviet reaction anywhere, or for numerous commentators during the Gulf Crisis to add that the U.S. and Britain are now free to use unlimited force against its third world enemy, since they were no longer inhibited by the Soviet deterrent. Of course, the end of the Cold War brings its problems, too. Notably, the technique for controlling the domestic population has had to shift, a problem recognized through the 1980s, as we've already seen. New enemies have to be invented. It becomes harder to disguise the fact that the real enemy has always been the poor who seek to plunder the rich. In particular, third-world miscreants who seek to break out of the service role. The war on certain drugs. Um, one substitute for the disappearing evil empire has been the threat of drug traffickers from Latin America. In early September 1989, a major government media blitz was launched by the president. That month, the AP wires carried more stories about drugs than about Latin America. Asia, the Middle East, and Africa combined. If you looked at television, every news program had a big section on how drugs were destroying our society, becoming the greatest threat to our existence, etc. Uh, the effect on public opinion was immediate. When Bush won the 1988 election, people said the budget deficit was the biggest problem facing the country. Only about 3% named drugs. After the media blitz, concern over the budget was way down and drugs soared to about 40 or 45 percent, which is highly unusual for an open question where no specific answers are even suggested. <laughs> now, when some client state complains that the U.S. government isn't sending in enough money, they no longer say we needed to stop the Russians. Rather, we needed to stop drug trafficking. Like the Soviet threat, this enemy provides a good excuse for a U.S. military presence where there's rebel activity or other unrest. So internationally, the war on drugs provides a cover for intervention. Domestically, it has little to do with drugs, but a lot to do with distracting the population, increasing repression in the inner cities, and building support for the attack on civil liberties. That's not to say that substance abuse isn't a serious problem. At the time the drug war was launched, deaths from tobacco were estimated at about 300,000 a year, with perhaps another 100,000 from alcohol. But these aren't the drugs the Bush administration targeted. It went after illegal drugs, which had caused many fewer deaths, over 3,500 a year, according to official figures. One reason for going after these drugs was that their use had been declining for some years, so the Bush administration could safely predict 
that its drug war would, quote, succeed in lowering drug use. Because it was going down anyway. Yeah. And they didn't want to bother with actually doing anything about what they say they, say they were trying to do. Yeah. So, follow the trend and claim victory. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sound familiar? The administration also targeted marijuana which hadn't caused any known deaths among some 60 million users. In fact, that crackdown has exacerbated the drug problem. Many marijuana users have turned from this relatively harmless drug to more dangerous drugs like cocaine, which are easier to conceal. Just as the drug war was launched with great fanfare in September 1989, the U.S. Trade Representative Panel held a hearing in Washington to consider a tobacco industry request that the U.S. impose sanctions on Thailand in retaliation for its efforts to restrict U.S. tobacco imports and advertising. Such U.S. government actions had already rammed this lethal addictive narcotic down the throats of consumers in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Taiwan, with human costs of the kind already in indicate, you know, killing hundreds of thousands of people. The U.S. Surgeon General, Everett Koop, testified at the USTR panel that uh, when we are pleading with foreign governments to stop the flow of cocaine, it is the height of hypocrisy for the United States to export tobacco. He added, years from now, our nation will look back on this application of free trade policy and find it scandalous. If we're even still here, for crying out loud. Okay. Thai witnesses also protested, predicting that the consequence of U.S. sanctions would be to reverse a decline in smoking achieved by their government's campaign against tobacco use. Responding to the U.S. tobacco company's claim that their product was the best in the world, a Thai witness said, Certainly in the Golden Triangle we have some of the best products, but we never ask the principle of free trade to govern such products. In fact, we suppress them. Critics recalled the Opium War 150 years earlier when the British government compelled China to open its doors to opium from British India, sanctimoniously pleading the virtues of free trade as they forcefully imposed large-scale drug addiction on China. Here we have the biggest drug story of the day. Imagine the screaming headlines, U.S. government, the world's leading drug peddler. It would surely sell papers, but the story passed virtually unreported and with not a hint of the obvious conclusions. Another aspect of the drug problem, which also received little attention, was the leading role of the U.S. government in stimulating drug trafficking since World War II. This happened in part when the U.S. began its post-war task of undermining the anti-fascist resistance and the labor movement became an important target. In France, the threat of the political power and influence of the labor movement was enhanced by its step to impede the flow of arms to French forces seeking to reconquer their former colony of Vietnam with U.S. aid. So the CIA undertook to weaken and split the French labor movement with the aid of top American labor leaders who were quite proud of their role. The task required strike breakers and goons. Uh, there was uh, an obvious supplier, the Mafia. Of course, they didn't take on this work just for the fun of it. They wanted a return for their efforts, and it was given to them. They were authorized to reestablish the heroin racket that had been suppressed by the fascist governments, the famous French connection that dominated the drug trade until the 1960s. By then, the center of the drug trade had shifted to Indochina, particularly Laos and Thailand. The shift was again a byproduct of a CIA operation, the Secret War, fought in those countries during the Vietnam War by a CIA mercenary army. They also wanted a payoff for their contributions. Later, as the CIA shifted its act activities to Pakistan and Afghanistan, the drug racket boomed there. The clandestine war against Nicaragua also provided a shot in the arm to drug traffickers in the region, as illegal CIA arms flights to the U.S. mercenary forces offered an easy way to ship drugs back to the U.S., sometimes through U.S. Air Force bases, traffickers report. The close correlation between the drug racket and international terrorism, sometimes called counterinsurgency, low-intensity conflict, or some other euphemism, is not surprising. Clandestine operations need plenty of money, which should be undetectable, and they need criminal operatives as well. The rest follows. War is peace, freedom is slavery. The terms of political discourse typically have two meanings. One is the dictionary meaning, and the other is a 
meaning that is useful for serving power, the doctrinal meaning. Um, take democracy. According to the common sense meaning, uh, society is democratic to the extent that people can participate in a mean, meaningful way in managing their affairs. But the doctrinal meaning of democracy is different. It refers to a system in which decisions are made by sectors of the business community and related elites. The public are to be only spectators of action, not participants. As leading democratic theorists, in this case Walter Lippmann, have explained, they are permitted to ratify the decisions of their betters and to lend their support to one or another of them, but not to interfere with the matters, with matters like public policy that are none of their business. If segments of the public depart from their apathy and begin to organize and enter the public arena, that's not democracy. Rather, it's a crisis of democracy in proper technical usage, a threat that has to be overcome in one way or another way. Uh, in El Salvador, by death squads, at home, by more subtle and indirect means. Or take free enterprise, a term that refers in practice to a system of public subsidy and private profit with massive government intervention in the economy to maintain a welfare state for the rich. In fact, in acceptable usage, just about any phrase containing the word free is likely to mean something like the opposite of its actual meaning. Or take defense against aggression, a phrase that's, u a phrase that's used predictably to refer to aggression. Ah, oh, fancy that. When the U.S. attacked South B Vietnam in the early 1960s, the liberal hero Adlai Stevenson, among others, explained that we were defending South Vietnam against internal aggression, that is, the aggression of South Vietnamese peasants against the U.S. Air Force and the U.S.-run mercenary army, which were driving them out of their homes and into concentration camps where they could be protected from the southern guerrillas. In fact, these peasants willingly supported the guerrillas while the U.S. client regime was an empty shell, as was agreed on all sides. So magnificently has the doctrinal system risen to its task that to this day, 30 years later, the idea that the U.S. attacked South Vietnam is unmentionable, even unthinkable. In the mainstream, the essential issues of the war are correspondingly beyond any possibility of discussion now. The guardians of political correctness, the real PC, can be quite proud of an achievement that would be hard to duplicate in a well-run totalitarian, totalitarian state. Or take the term peace process. The naive might think that it refers to efforts to seek peace. Under this meaning, we would say that the peace process in the Middle East includes, for example, the offer for a full peace treaty with Israel by President Sadat of Egypt in 1971 along lines advocated by virtually the entire world, including official U.S. policy. The Security Council resolution of January 1966 introduced by the major Arab states with the backing of the PLO, which called for a two-state settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict in the terms of a near-universal international consensus. PLO offers through the 1980s to negotiate with Israel for mutual recognition and annual votes at the UN General Assembly, most recently in December 1990, voted 144 to 2, calling for an international conference on the Israel-Arab problem, etc. But the sophisticated understand that these efforts do not form part of the peace process. The reason is that in the PC meaning, the term peace process refers to what the U.S. government is doing. In cases mentioned, this is to block international efforts to seek peace. The cases cited do not fall within the peace process because the U.S. backed, because the US backed Israel's rejection of Sadat's offer vetoed the Security Council resolution, opposed negotiation and mutual recognition of the PLO in Israel, and regularly joins with Israel in opposing, thereby in effect vetoing any attempt to move towards a peaceful diplomatic settlement at the UN or elsewhere. The peace process is restricted to U.S. initiatives which call for a unilateral U.S. determined settlement with no recognition of Palestinian national rights. That's the way it works. Those who cannot master these skills must seek another profession.
There are many other examples. Take the term special interest. The well-oiled Republican PR systems of the 1980s regularly accused Democrats of being the party of the special interest. Women, labor, the elderly, the young, uh, farmers. In short, the general population. There was only one sector of the population never listed as a special interest. Corporations and business generally. That makes sense. In PC discourse, their special interests are the national interest, to which all must bow. The Democrats plaintively retorted that they were not the party of special interest. They served the national interest, too. That was correct, but their problem has been is that they lack the single-minded class consciousness of their Republican opponents. The latter are not confused about their role as representatives of the o of the owners and managers of the society who are fighting a bitter class war against the general population, often adopting ver vulgar Marxist rhetoric and concepts, resorting to jingoist hysteria, fear and terror, awe of great leaders, and the other standard devices for population control. The Democrats are less clear about their allegiances, hence less effective in the propaganda wars. How true is that? Oh my goodness. Finally, take the term conservative. I'm a conservative. Um, finally, take the term conservative, which has come to refer to advocates of a powerful state, which interferes massively in the economy and in social life. They advocate huge state expenditures and a post-war peak of protectionist measures and insurance against market risk, risk, narrowing individual liberties through legislation and court packing, protecting the holy state from unwarranted inspection by the irrelevant citizenry. In short, those programs that are the precise opposite of traditional conservatism. Their allegiance is to the people who own the country, for crying out loud, and therefore ought to govern it, in the words of founder, found, founding father John Jay. Um, <clears throat> it's really not that hard once one understands the rules. To make sense of political discourse, it's necessary to give a running translation into English, decoding the doublespeak of the media, academic, social scientist, and the secular priesthood generally. Its function is not obscure. The effect is to make it impossible to find words to talk about matters of human significance in a coherent way. We can then be sure that little will be understood about how our society works and what is happening in the world. A major contribution to democracy in the PC sense of the word. Socialism, real and fake. <sighs> One can debate the meaning of the term socialism, but if it means anything, it means control of production by the workers themselves, not owners and managers who rule them and control all decisions, whether in capitalist enterprises or an absolutist state. Okay, so now we've established that it's never happened anywhere. The workers uh, are not in control of the resources anywhere. They're not managing the... Uh, the guys on the assembly line are not in charge anywhere. Okay, so it's never happened. Okay. To refer to the Soviet Union as socialist is an interesting case of doctrinal doublespeak. The Bolshevik coup of October 1917 placed state power in the hands of Lenin and Trotsky, who moved quickly to dismantle the incipient socialist institutions that had grown up during the popular revolution of the preceding months. The factory councils, the Soviets, in fact, any organ of popular control, and to convert the workforce into what they called a labor army under the command of the leader in any meaningful sense of the term. Um, socialism, the Bolsheviks moved at once to destroy its existing elements. No socialist deviation has been permitted since. These developments came as no surprise to leading Marxist intellectuals who had criticized Lenin's doctrines for years, as had Trotsky, because they would centralize authority in the hands of the vanguard party and its leaders. 
In fact, decades earlier, the anarchist thinker Bakunin had predicted that the emerging intellectual class would follow one of two paths. Either they would try to exploit popular struggles to take power themselves, becoming a brutal, oppressive red bureaucracy, or they would become the managers and ideologists of the state capitalist societies if popular revolution failed. It was a perceptive insight on both counts. The world's two major propaganda systems did not agree on much, but they did agree on using the term socialism to refer to the immediate destruction of every, every element of socialism by the Bolsheviks. That's not too surprising. The Bolsheviks called their system socialist so as to exploit the moral prestige of socialism while doing the opposite. The, you know, look at what they're doing. They're doing that here, okay? So, yeah, conservatism is actually the exact opposite of being conservative. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> they exploit the prestige of the term. I'm a conservative. The West adopted the same usage for the opposite reason, to defame the feared libertarian ideals by associating them with the Bolshevik dungeon to undermine the popular belief that there really might be progress towards a more just society with democratic control over its basic institutions and concern for human needs and rights. If socialism is the tyranny of Lenin and Stalin, then sane people will say, not for me. And if that's the only alternative to corporate state capitalism, then many will submit to its authoritarian structures as the only reasonable choice. With the collapse of the Soviet system, there's an opportunity to revive the lively and vigorous libertarian socialist thought that was not able to withstand the doctrinal repressive assaults of the major systems of power. How large a hope that is, we cannot know, but at least one roadblock has been removed. In that sense, the disappearance of the Soviet Union is a small victory for socialism, much as the defeat of the fascist powers was. You know, it's true. The media, whether they're called liberal or conservative, the major media are large corporations owned and interlinked with even larger conglomerates. Like other corporations, they sell a product to a market. The market is advertisers, that is, other businesses. The product is audiences. For the elite media, <clears throat> that set the basic agenda to which others adapt, the product is furthermore relatively privileged audiences. So we have major corporations selling fairly wealthy and privileged audiences to other businesses. Not surprisingly, the picture of the world presented reflects the narrow and biased interest and values of the sellers, the buyers, and the product. Other factors reinforce the same distortion, but cultural managers, editors, leading col columnists, etc., share class interests and association with state and business managers and other privileged sectors. There is, in fact, a regular flow of high-level people among corporations, government, and media. Access to state authorities is important to maintain a competitive position. Leaks, for example, are often fabrications and deceit produced by the authorities with the cooperation of the media who pretend they don't know. In return, state authorities demand cooperation and submissiveness. Other power centers also have devices to punish departures from orthodoxy, ranging from the stock market to an effective vilification and defamation apparatus. The outcome is not, of course, entirely uniform. To serve the interests of the powerful, the media must present a tolerably realistic picture of the world. And professional integrity and honesty sometimes interfere with the overriding mission. The best journalists are typically quite aware of the factors that shape the media product and seek to use such openings as are provided. The result is that one can learn a lot by critical and skeptical reading of what the media produce. The media are only one part of a larger doctrinal system. Other parts are journals of opinion, the schools and universities, academic scholarship, and so on. We're much more aware of the media, particularly the prestige media, because those who critically analyze ideology have focused on them. The larger system hasn't been studied as much because it's harder to investigate systematically, but there's good reason to believe it represents the same interest as the media, just as one would anticipate. 
The doctrinal system, which produces what we call propaganda when discussing enemies, has two distinct targets. One target is what's sometimes called the political class, the roughly 20% of the population that's relatively educated, more or less articulate, playing some role in decision-making. Their acceptance of, of doctrine is crucial because they're in a position to design and implement policy. Then there's the other 80% or so of the population. These are Lippmann's spectators of action, whom he referred to as the bewildered herd. <sighs> they are supposed to follow orders and keep out of the way of the important people. They're the target of the real mass media, the tabloids, the sitcoms, the Super Bowl, and so on. These sectors of the doctrinal system serve to divert the unwashed masses and reinforce the basic social values, passivity, submissiveness to authority, the overriding virtue of greed and personal gain, lack of concern for others, fear of real or imagined enemies, etc. The goal is to keep the bewildered herd bewildered. It's unnecessary for them to trouble themselves about what's happening in the world. In fact, it's undesirable. If they see too much of reality, they may set themselves to change it. That's not to say that the media can't be influenced by the general population. The dominant institutions, whether political, economic, or doctrinal, are not immune to public pressures. Independent, alternative media can also play an important role. Though they lack resources, almost by definition, they gain significance in the same way that popular organizations do, by bringing together people with limited resources who can multiply their effectiveness and their own understanding through their interactions. Precisely the democratic threat that's so feared by dominant elites. The future! Things have changed. It's important to recognize how much the scene has changed in the past 30 years as a result of the popular movements that organized in a loose and chaotic way around such issues as civil rights, peace, feminism, the environment, and other issues of human concern. Take the Kennedy and Reagan administrations, which are similar in a number of ways in their basic policies and commitments. When Kennedy launched a huge international terrorist campaign against Cuba after his invasion failed and then escalated the murderous state terror in South Vietnam to outright aggression, there was no detectable protest. It wasn't until hundreds of thousands of American troops were deployed and all of Indochina was under devastating attack with hundreds of thousands slaughtered that protests became more than marginally significant. In contrast, as soon as the Reagan administration hinted that they intended to intervene directly in Central America, spontaneous protests erupted at a scale sufficient to compel the state terrorists to turn to other means. Leaders may crow about the end of the Vietnam Syndrome, but they know better. A National Security Policy Review of the Bush administration, leaked at the moment of the ground attack in the Gulf, noted that in cases where the U.S. confronts much weaker enemies, the only ones that the true state statesmen will agree to fight, our challenge will not be simply to defeat them, but to defeat them decisively and rapidly. Any other outcome would be embarrassing and might undercut political support, understood to be very thin. By now, classical intervention is not even considered an option. The means are limited to clandestine terror, uh, kept secret from the domestic population, or decisive and rapid demolition of much weaker enemies. After huge propaganda campaigns depicting them as monsters of indescribable power. Much the same is true across the board. Take 1992. If the Columbus Quincentenary had been in 1962, it would have been a celebration of the liberation of the continent. In 1992, that response no longer has a monopoly, a fact that has aroused much hysteria among the cultural managers who are used to near totalitarian control. They now rant about the fascist excesses of those who urge respect for other people and other cultures. In other areas, too, there's more openness and understanding, more skepticism and questioning of authority. Of course, the latter tendencies are double-edged. They may lead to independent thought, popular organizing and pressures for much needed institutional change, or they may provide a mass base of frightened people for new authoritarian leaders. These possible outcomes are not a matter for speculation, but for action, with stakes that are very large. What you can do. What can you do?
in any country, there's some group that has real power. It's not a big secret where the power is in the United States. It basically lies in the hands of people who determine investment decisions. What's produced, what uh, distributed. They staff the government by and large, choose the planners, and set the general conditions for the doctrinal system. One of the things they want is a passive, quiescent population. So one of the things that you can do to make life uncomfortable for them is not be passive and quiescent. There are lots of ways of doing that. Even just asking questions can have an important effect. Demonstrations, writing letters, voting uh, can all, all be meaningful. It depends on the situation, but the main point is, is it's got to be sustained and organized. If you go to one demonstration and then go home, that's something. But the people in power can live with that. What they can't live with is sustained pressure that keeps building organizations that keep doing things, people that keep learning lessons from the last time and doing it better next time. Any system of power, even a fascist dictatorship, is responsive to public dissidents. It's certainly true in a country like this, where fortunately the state doesn't have a lot of force to force, co coerce people. During the Vietnam War, direct resistance to the war was quite significant, and it, it was a cost that the government had to pay. If elections are just something in which some portion of the population goes and pushes a button every couple of years, they don't matter. But if the citizens organize to press a position and pressure their representatives about it, elections can matter. Members of the House of Representatives can be influenced much more easily than senators, and senators somewhat more easily than the president, who is usually immune. When you get to that level, policy is decided almost totally by the wealthy and powerful people who own and manage the country. But you can organize on a scale that will influence representatives. You can get them to come to your homes, to be yelled at by a group of neighbors, or you can sit in, at their offices. Whatever works in the circumstances, it can make a difference, often an important one. You can also do your own research. Don't just rely on conventional history books and political science texts. Text. Go back to specialist monographs and to original sources, national security memoranda, and similar documents. Most good libraries have reference departments where you can find them. It does require a bit of effort. Most of the material is junk, and you have to read a ton of stuff before you find anything good. There are guides that give you hints about where to look, and sometimes you'll find references to secondary sources that look intriguing. Uh, often they're misinterpreted, but they suggest places to search. It's no big mystery, and it's not intellectually difficult. It involves some work, but anybody can do it as a spare time job. And the results of that research can change people's minds. Real research uh, is always a collective activity, and its results can make a large contribution to changing consciousness, increasing insight and understanding, and lead to constructive action. That is true. The struggle continues. The struggle for freedom is never over. The people of the third world need our sympathetic understanding. And much more than that, they need our help, for crying out loud. We can give them uh, with a margin of... Sur we, we can provide them with a margin of survival by internal disruption in the United States. Whether they can succeed against the kind of brutality we impose on them depends in large part on what happens here. The courage they show is quite amazing. I personally had the privilege, and it is a privilege, of catching a glimpse of that courage at first hand in Southeast Asia, in Central America, and on the occupied West Bank. It's a very moving and inspiring experience, and invariably brings to my mind some contemptuous remarks of Rousseau's on Europeans who have abandoned freedom and justice for the peace and repose they enjoy in their chains. He goes on to say, When I see multitudes of entirely naked savages scorn European voluptuousness and endure hunger, fire, and the sword, and death to preserve only their independence, I feel that it does not behoove slaves to reason about freedom. Rousseau. Uh, that's on my list. Okay. People who think that these are mere words understand very little about the world. And that's just a part of the task that lies before us. There's a growing third world at home. There are systems of illegitimate authority in every corner of the social, political, 
economic and cultural worlds. For the first time in human history, we have to face the problem of protecting an environment that can sustain a decent human existence. We don't know that honest and dedicated effort will be enough to solve or even mitigate such problems as these. We can be quite confident, however, that the lack of such efforts will spell disaster. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the thrilling and exciting ending of uh, The Thing, the show of the reading cow from another world with bedtime stories uh, uh, for your edification uh, uh, thing show. Uh, well, where was I? Okay. I'm so tired. Okay. But uh, uh, once again, at your service, uh, join us again next time uh, when, we can, uh, when we learn more things. And until then, uh, goodbye.